Manhattan companies got caught with their pants down when punk and new wave exploded on the scene. And to make sure they don't get left behind again, the majors have been keeping tabs on regional bands in recent years. They've been scouting out some of the better independent groups and waving international contracts in their faces. This is part of the story behind the rise of 10,000 Maniacs, who made two independent records before hooking up with a major label for their current album, The Wishing Chair. To find out more about this unusual band, I'm going to speak with Dennis Drew of 10,000 Maniacs, who is sitting in the studio with me now. Hello, Dennis, and welcome to Nightlines. Hi, Ron. Thank you. The uh, the Smiths, we play them from time to time, and they have a tune called That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you're beginning to feel that way about uh, your band's name. Yeah, almost. Um, but it's good to have a name that people um, are attracted to and uh, interested in. At least I mean, curious. Curious, exactly. I mean, our name does uh, uh, get people to write about us and uh, put our name in the headline just because it's so unusual. So it served that purpose. But uh, we're getting tired of the math jokes. Like, where are the other... And then 900, 9,000, and everyone has to on go on, through on, the, on to the, figure the, out. the subtraction, yeah. And the mathematics of bands, you couldn't carry that, that big a crowd anyways. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about early days with uh, 10,000 Maniacs. The Wishing Chair is your third release. Yes. But uh, it's your first on a major label, mm -hmm. Electra, yes? Mm -hmm, yeah. How long has the band been together? Well, pretty much since uh, September of 81, although we had a couple of personnel changes. When the band started out... We were just a local band playing on weekends to have fun, and uh, uh, Robert Buck, our guitar player, wasn't with us. He was taking a couple of months off, and we had a different drummer. And Robert joined that December, and uh, Jerry, our present drummer, joined in 83. So actually, our first record was made with a different drummer. Okay, uh, but the nucleus really has been together something like five years then? Yes. Okay. You're from, most of you, from, from Jamestown in New Jamestown, York Jamestown, New York. Yes, uh, the only thing I read about Jamestown is that there are more people in the cemetery there <laughs> than living in the, in the town. Well, that's true, but that's true of a lot of towns now in the Northeast. But it's also the home of Lucille Ball. The original, that's where yes, Lucille sir. Ball was born? And, uh, that's right. <laughs> I'm wondering how the band can make use of that, but well, with your title. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about... Jamestown, though. What's it like there? there? What kind of music scene is there in Jamestown? Well, there, there isn't uh, much of a new music scene, but there is a traditional uh, bluegrass, folk, and country music scene, although no one's ever really made it that's come from Jamestown. But there's a great Appalachian influence and uh, uh, a Blue Ridge Mountain influence, too, that comes up from um, West Virginia. So we've learned a lot of bluegrass. We have a lot of friends that play bluegrass, and when, sometimes when we play in Jamestown, we'll have a fiddler come up and play with us sometimes. Work out with. Mm -hmm. the, the route most people would expect your band to have gone for success mm -hmm. would have been your eyes turned towards New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I understand you went to Athens, Georgia. Actually, we went to Atlanta, which is um, the bigger city near Athens. But uh, we didn't ever think we were ready to go to New York. We thought we'd get eaten alive if we went to New York right away. So we tried to take a grassroots approach and approach all the college radio stations uh, in the big college towns um, in areas that we thought were receptive. And at the time, in the early 80s, there was seemed to be a, a good scene, as it were, in North Carolina and Athens, Georgia, the home of REM, the B-52s, and of course, North Carolina, where uh, Let's Active and the DBs the and, yeah. and all those people were from. So we thought that would be a good place to go, a good place to start and work our way back north. Plus, we had friends down there at the very beginning. You really can only go where you have friends. And we had friends in Virginia, and we had friends in Atlanta, and we had friends in Florida. So that's where we went. If we had had friends in Ottawa and Detroit, yeah, that's where we would, would have gone first. Okay. Dennis, tell me a little bit about uh, one of the songs on, uh, on your latest album, Scorpio Rising. Scorpio Rising uh, is actually one of the first songs written by Robert Buck, our guitar player. When we were rehearsing in our rehearsal space, Rob sat down and started playing that riff. And uh, he said, this is the first riff I ever learned on guitar. We said, well, this is great. Let's make a song out of it. So we started plodding away at it. We said, well, let's make it vaguely metal. Let's make this our, uh, uh, you know, our parody of metal music. And when we first did it, we used to camp it up quite a bit more than we do now. And... Uh, so it just took off. It fell right away. The, we had watched a film by Kenneth Anger the night before, Scorpio Rising. And for no other reason, we decided to name that song Scorpio Rising. All right, let's hear Scorpio Rising on Nightline. And I'm talking to Dennis Drew of 10,000 Maniacs. Hmm. Dennis, your uh, latest release, produced by Joe Boyd. Mm -hmm. uh, Nightline's listeners will remember that he produced the latest R.E.M. album. Was Joe Boyd your choice uh, or the record companies to do your album? Well, he certainly wasn't the record companies. He was our choice. 
they were a little afraid of using Joe Boyd since he's never really had a hit record in his life. Although he did produce uh, Midnight at the Oasis by Maria Moldar. Moldar. Remember Good that? Lord, yes. Right. It's a long time ago. Well, we were very big fans of the British folk scene, and we felt that everything we'd ever heard produced by Joe Boyd had such integrity and such a timeless feel. We didn't want to use a producer that would give us a sound that was immediately identifiable as in the 80s. We wanted to make something timeless rather than trendy. And uh, Joe helped us get that timeless feel and a relaxed feel, I think. All right. Who did the record company want uh, out of curiosity to produce? Well, they really didn't know. Uh, we had several choices, but we really didn't get to meet anyone and make a valid decision. And I, I remember Bob Krasnow, the head of Electra, his quote was, uh, um, Joe Boyd, oh, he's a genius, but um, ever since he went communist, he hasn't been any good. So, uh, end of discussion. End of discussion, but they let us use him anyway. We were very happy with Joe. All right. Uh, I know you had to wait for your producer to be available. Yeah, yeah, the, that's uh, funny, and, you know. Uh, actually, when we, before we got signed, I went to CBS Records, because uh, the guy, Howard Thompson from Electra, was at CBS. And I went there and went up to the office, and he said, okay, we're going to sign you. Uh, let's just talk about the future. Who would you like to produce you? And the first name I said was Joe Boyd's. But, of course, he wasn't available. Producers aren't always available right away. So we had to wait. So what we did was is we bought a, a lot of equipment, obviously new stage equipment, but we also bought a lot of recording equipment so that we could start to make demos of these songs and actually learn how to record ourselves because I think every band should be able to produce themselves. As long as you know the terminology and you can uh, learn how to work with an engineer and you understand a bit about recording, you can do it. So we bought this equipment with that in mind for the future and we worked out a lot of the parts for these songs uh, trying to make our stay in the studio less intimidating. So you little... spent your advance money on... <laughs> well, not all of it, but... <laughs> <laughs> we spent, uh, yeah. And did it pay off? Because I can imagine time, both Joe Boyd's time and studio time, very expensive. So it helps to know exactly what mm -hmm. you want. I don't think it paid off like it could have. Because when we, we hadn't played live in so long when we went into the studio, that uh, even though we knew what we wanted to do... We still had to get our chops back, so to speak. So it still took several takes. But uh, be it, ha having laid off, waiting for Joe Boyd for like two months was a very difficult thing. So that the first few weeks in the studio were, were difficult for us. All right. Are you happy with Electra? Yes. I th we're happy with the people there. It's a major company. And uh, decisions are made in a corporate fashion. They're very slow. Uh, and, and the music business is very fast. So it's hard for us. When we ask for some support... Uh, to do dates in Europe, it'll take them a month to make a decision, and by that time it's too late. But it's that way with a lot of major record companies, and it's, it's a problem that every band has to face until they get big enough to have unbelievable control. Well, you're winning a larger audience. Of course, that also means, though, the critics are paying a little more attention to you. Well, the critics have been very kind to us. I really can't believe how much we've been written about all over the country. Uh, the Associated Press has syndicated columns about us. Uh, the L.A. Times has written several things about us, uh, you know, more than I think we deserve, really. Okay, uh, but there have been some either snarky or critical. How do you take? First of all, if you're going to really believe critics, you're going to have to believe that you're both the best band in the world and the worst band in the At world. At the same time. Right. So you've got to just kind of come down in the middle. Uh, America is anti-intellectual. The more intelligent you work, the more thoughtful you work, uh, the harder it is to get it across to the masses, and even to some critics. Because the critics now, most of whom earn a very comfortable living, most of whom are very well educated really enjoy bringing themselves down to a street level because they feel they have to get in touch with the raw emotions of the street people so that they're always pumping for rock and roll and and uh i don't even really know how to describe it do you understand what i mean is that uh, it sounds like he's putting on his jeans to go out as he steps down from his penthouse is that what i'm hearing i think that's true that's exactly true of a lot of critics and that's one one of the few things that they criticize us for is being too subtle or too pretty okay folks well i want to tell you that uh, dennis drew is wearing just uh, his own his sweater is his mogi is mine <laughs> and uh, corduroy pants so geez he's even got his ear pierced the same side too I... now wait a minute these are I'm sorry, glasses. those are just glasses that were sticking out through. My mistake. It's my fake mistake. earring look. For people who like not earrings, bad, not bad. I've got them. For those who don't like earrings... You can just pull them off. That's right. All right. I want to thank you, Dennis Drew, for stopping by to chat. We've been chatting with uh, Dennis Drew of 10,000 Maniacs, and uh, let's hear the band speak for themselves from their album, The Wishing Chair. This is My Mother, The War on CBC Stereo. <laughs> 